Hello and welcome. I'm Harvey Tuch and I work at Google. I uh, am the TL of the Envoy platform team. And today I'm going to be co-presenting with Mark Roth, a colleague of mine who uh, leads the gRPC C++ efforts at Google. And we're going to be talking about the future of XDS and in particular some of the changes around versioning and XDS transport, which are going to be landing over the coming year. This talk's gonna be in two parts. The first part, we're gonna look at XDS transport evolution, and the next part will be on versioning. So getting going with uh, transport evolution. I wanna start the talk by exploring some of the limitations in the XDS transport that exists today, and in particular, when we wanna address some of the more uh, sophisticated use cases that are coming down the pipe. But before I do so, I'd like to point out that actually the XDS transport is Pretty remarkable in that it's uh, brought huge improvements to how Envoy receives its configuration from control planes. Uh, going back to 2017, all we had was polling-based REST uh, for XDS delivery, and that had significant issues with performance on control plane, uh, scalability, and also for latency of updates. And the versions uh, XDS transport for essentially a version pub sub scheme, which we introduced since then, has brought about huge improvements and it's working incredibly well today. And so we want to evolve this forward incrementally without breaking the world and without uh, affecting anyone who's using it today. But at the same time, we want to address some of these limitations, which I'm going to talk about. So what are these limitations? Uh, so the first of these is that there's actually uh, issues around cacheability of XDS. And so this impacts uh, our XDS as we want to scale it up to many, many different endpoints. And this could be, for example, in Envoy Mobile as depicted on this slide, where we might have millions or tens or hundreds of millions of endpoints. And we need a good story for how XDS resources can be distributed and fanned out. And there's this project called XDS Relay, which uh, I suggest checking out, which basically is building the first steps of this. But to do this kind of caching and relay, um, there, are, there are issues and Let's go through some of these. The first is that the XDS resource names that they exist today are just opaque strings. And they're not a really a unique cache key because they don't include um, uh, a bunch of useful contextual information, which includes things like uh, node ID or metadata, which are actually provided in the XDS stream, but out of band with the XDS resource name. So if you're trying to cache just on XDS resource name, that's not sufficient. And uh, as a result, uh, even if you want to use something like traditional CDNs with uh, the XDS HTTP transport, things don't work particularly well today. The next major sort of uh, next-gen use case is federation. And this is when you want to have multiple control planes managing XDS. And today we have some limited support for having more than one control plane with Envoy, but it's at a very coarse granularity and there's, you can't like, for example, delegate a single route configuration to a different server and this kind of thing. So in this world, we want to think about, well, we've got multiple XDS servers. There's, it might be in different clusters, it might be in different clouds, it might be on premise and so on. We want to be able to provide fine grained delegation of authority over resources and failover between servers as resources as they come and go. And ultimately what folks want to do probably as they scale up is disaggregate the control plane into a number of microservices, which this sort of form of federation supports. So today, as I mentioned before, we kind of lack some of the support. Um, we have no explicit notion of what an authority is and uh, sort of what a, uh, a node in this graph that's where a drawing looks like. Um, resource names, not only they are opaque and uncacheable, but they're also global and there's no way to like, qualify them by specific authorities or have uh, each authority manage its own resource namespace. There's no support for redirection or failover alternatives and our existing config sources are pretty coarse grained. Okay. Then there's the issue of collections. So XDS today really doesn't have a great distinction between singleton and collection resources. So we would like there to be um, a better way of thinking about this. And a lot of the issues around this would surface while well, uh, GRPC, and Mark's got a great talk on GRPC adopting XDS, we're switching to XDS. And in this effort, it became clear that there's a lot of uh, strangeness about the corner cases that XDS makes around collections, which we would like to 
resolve and make work better. And this really feeds into my final slide, which is that we have quite a bit of accumulated technical debt in XDS, which some of these things made sense at that time, but as we've gone to sort of stretch and test the parameters of uh, XDS transport and its use, it uh, became apparent that there really are uh, issues here which need um, some mitigation. And then we want to do this to simplify control planes, make things easier to implement, make them more robust and reliable. And there are all these surprises. I mentioned before the weird uh, treatment of collections for LDS and CDS. Uh, there's also the fact that we have multiple wire protocols effectively now for state of the world and Delta. We have this issue with something called aliases, which we introduced especially for VHDS. So our proposal, and I have links to the proposal in the final slide of this talk, uh, goes about systematically addressing all of these. And I want to hand it, uh, things over now to Mark, who's going to talk about one of the core concepts, which really um, is fundamental to, to this, and that is an idea of uh, um, a structured resource name, which takes the form of a URL and has this UDPA schema. So I'll hand things over to uh, Mark at this point. So the, the key to addressing the limitations that Harvey spoke about is the uh, this new naming scheme for XES resources in which resource names are represented as a UDPA URI. Uh, so, the, so let's talk about the anatomy of a, of a UDPA URI. The, the first part of the URI that's interesting is the authority. This indicates who's authoritative for the resource, which is not necessarily the same as the XDS server that's used by the client. Um, the client's bootstrap file will indicate what server or servers to use uh, to access resources for a given authority, which might or might not be the same as the, the actual name of the XDS server, right? Um, and so an example of a case where you might want them to be different is in a large distributed uh, uh, infrastructure. If you've got, uh, for scalability reasons, you might have sort of a, a local caching XDS proxy, you know, in each data center that, that has clients, and you might have those clients access the data through the local caching proxy, even though the authority is still some, you know, centralized uh, single point uh, that, is, that is centralized across the entire, you know, global infrastructure. Um, the authority acts as a global namespace for resource names. Uh, so, you know, if you have resources in, you know, if you have an authority that has a bunch of resources in it, you can feel free to organize them however you want, and you're not going to have any naming conflicts with anything that anyone, uh, any resources that anyone has created in, in other authorities. Uh, the authority is an optional part of the URI. Uh, so if you have a non-federating use case, just a, you know, a bunch of local servers that don't interact with anything else, you can just omit the authority and have everything in sort of the, you know, the empty string as the authority name. Um, in the future, the authority might be used to authenticate the resources themselves using some sort of signing mechanism. That's not something we actually have today, but it's a possible future direction that we could go in here. The next part of the URI is the resource type, which is, you know, listener, cluster, route configuration, that sort of thing. The ID is, is essentially the path part of the URI. Uh, it can be any string that you want. It's totally up to you as an authority owner as to how you want to uh, lay out your, your resource names. Uh, context params are similar to query params in an HTTP URI. They provide a way to serve multiple variants of the same resource, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. And the final part of the URI is the directive. This is similar to the fragment in an HTTP URI. It's a, uh, a directive for how the client should uh, interpret or use some part of the resource, uh, but it's never actually sent to the server. It's only interpreted on the, on the client. Next slide, please. So here are some examples of uh, UDPA URIs. Uh, first, we have an example of a fairly basic URI. It's got authority xds.example.com. And so Envoy would look in its bootstrap file to determine which server to query for this authority. The resource type here is listener. And the ID is service mesh slash sidecar. And again, this can be any path that you want. This is just sort of you know, one arbitrary example of, of what you could put in here. The second example so shows the use of context params. In this case, the context param is node type equals front end. Um, note that the context params are actually part of the resource name. They're part of the unique identity of the resource. So from the XDS perspective, two resource names that vary only by uh, content params. If, for example, you had another one that was node type equals backend, from the XDS perspective, that's actually a different resource. Um, from the human perspective, in practice, usually if you, if you have a resource that that varies only based on the context params, that's usually two variants of the same, you know, the same basic resource. It's telling the client to do the same thing, but in slightly different ways for slightly different scenarios. Um, context params do actually come from different places, not just from the UI, URI. There are some uh, additional sources of params that can get added on uh, when requests are made to the, GRP, uh, to the uh, XDS server, excuse me. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. 
The final example here shows use of a directive. In this case, there's a, a directive called alt, uh, which specifies a fallback resource. So when the primary resource is, uh, doesn't exist or the server can't be reached, uh, the client can sort of know to fall back to this uh, alternative resource. Next slide. All right, so let's talk more about uh, context parameters. Um, as mentioned earlier, the uh, purpose is to allow servers to provide multiple variants of the same resource. Uh, this is the key to making all kinds of information uh, a first class part of the cache key for resources. Context params come from multiple places, so we'll talk about these in order. Um, first, there are node identity parameters, which can be populated from the node message in the bootstrap file. Uh, these are prefixed with the string udpa.node. Um, this is a key part of replacing the wildcard queries in LDS and CDS that Harvey mentioned earlier. Uh, the idea here is to use these context params to encode things that used to live in the node message only. So instead of the server looking at the client's node identity to decide which resources to return, the client can explicitly ask for what it wants in a flexible way. Uh, next. The, uh, the second source of, of context parameters are the ones encoded in the URI themselves. So this is like the example I showed earlier of node type equals front end. Uh, it can have any prefix. There's no, uh, no restrictions on, on what the, the content is. Uh, and it is applied after the node identity params, so it can actually override them. So you, know, you could actually specify something in the URI that's udpa.node.something, and it would override whatever comes from the bootstrap file. Next is um, the third source of context params is client features. These use the prefix udpa.clientfeature. These are not user controlled. They're added automatically by the implementation. Um, unlike the client features that exist in the node message today, these client features are resource specific. So a client feature that, that is specific to, for example, EDS will only be added to requests for EDS resources. And this prevents unnecessarily polluting caches with duplicate copies of the same uh, resource, which is what would occur if, you know, um, you know, if, if uh, the same CDS resource was accessed by two different clients that had different values for a client feature that is relevant only to EDS, right? You wouldn't want to have to make two copies of that. So this avoids that. Uh, next, uh, the final source of context parameters is uh, per resource type attributes. These use the prefix udpa.resource. Just like client features, these are not user defined. They're added automatically by the implementation. And they're defined for each resource type as needed. Uh, the one concrete example here is for VHDS. We plan to use this to uh, allow the client to, to request the specific virtual host that the client wants. So this would be a um, uh, the thing that would replace that aliases mechanism that Harvey mentioned earlier. Uh, next slide. Now, another thing that we're introducing is first class support for collections. There are two types of collections, list collections and glob collections. A list collection is a resource that contains a collection of resources of a particular type. Uh, the collection resource itself will have its own type. So for example, a resource of type listener collection is a resource that contains a collection of listeners. A resource of type cluster collection is a resource that contains a collection of clusters. Um, as indicated by those examples, this is another key part of replacing the wildcard queries for LDS and CDS. Now, each resource in a collection can be either an inlined resource or a UDPA URI referring to another resource, which the client must fetch separately. So here in this example, we have a listener collection resource with name xyes.example.com, listener collection, sidecar one, just an arbitrary name that, you know, uh, uh, as far as the ID goes anyway, uh, just an arbitrary name that I made up for the example. Um, and in this case, the collection contains three resources. There's one inline listener for port 80. There's another inline listener for port 443. And then there's a reference to an external listener resource, which the client would have to go and fetch separately. Um, note that for the inline resources, there are names that are that are sort of attached to them. These names can be used in a uh, entry directive on the client to refer to one of the inline resources in the collection. Next slide. The other type of collections that we're going to support are glob collections. Uh, these are an alternative to list collections uh, for cases that need additional scalability. So the way this works is the client requests a resource where the last component of the ID is star, and it, it works basically like a simple shell glob pattern. The server will return all resources in this quote unquote directory. Um, the client will then know what resources in the response match the this request by virtue of them all being in this requested directory. So it's sort of a you know a path prefix match sort of thing. Um, the, the reason that this is more scalable than a list collection is that in the case of a list collection, if one, you know, let's say you have a list collection with a whole bunch of inline entries and any one of them changes, you have to resend the entire list collection. 
Um, but in a case like, um, you know, so one of the limitations we've had in EDS is that EDS has all of the endpoints listed in it. And we know that there are cases where there are really large numbers of endpoints and then like one of them changes and you have to resend the whole thing, which uses a lot of bandwidth and is not really the way we want things to work. So with glob collections, we're going to be able to build something that we're going to call uh, LEDS, the Locality Endpoint Discovery Service, which will be based on glob collections and will allow uh, each individual endpoint to be updated to the client uh, independently of each other. Next slide. Um, next, let's talk about different ways that you can use UDP URIs to address various federation scenarios. Um, there are three different ways for a resource from one authority to sort of delegate to resources in another authority. Um, first, the delegation can happen at the normal handoff point between resources. You know, we know that uh, listener resources can tell the client what route configuration to request via RDS. So that RDS resource can actually be in a different resource, uh, sorry, in a different authority than the listener resource was. So that's one way of sort of handing off. Uh, next. The uh, second type of, of authority delegation is redirection. So this is similar to an HTTP redirect. The client will request a specific resource and the server then tells it to use a different resource instead. And that resource can be in a different authority. So this is a way for one authority to sort of say, I want to delegate you know, this particular resource to some other authority. Uh, next, uh, so the final form of authority delegation is having a list collection that includes references to resources in a different authority. So in this example, we have a listener collection in the authority xds.example.com, but it's redirecting inside of it, it's referencing inside of it uh, resources in other.com and mumble.com. Next slide, please. Now, a different type of authority handoff is a failover. This is where we use that alt directive that we talked about earlier. Uh, but in this case, the alt directive points to a resource in a, in a different authority than the original resource was. This sort of thing can be useful in cases where you want to like fall back to a different configuration from a local XDS server when the remote XDS server is not reachable. Uh, next slide. Oh, uh, and let me hand back to Harvey at this point. Thanks, Mark. OK. So in summary, like the real win here is we've got the ability to cache XDS resources. We can delegate and failover for authorities. We've got better support for collections. And we've eliminated a bunch of technical debt. And we're now ready to go, I think, for things like federation. So this is like all pretty exciting. Now, in terms of the implementation roadmap, we've just started to do this. And we have the first three, I guess, items in that roadmap. Um, underway, but at very early stages. We plan in Q4 on landing probably one through four at least in this list. And um, then I think once we've landed that, which is basically support for the, the core UDPA URLs and um, the glob collections, the rest of the, uh, the uh, implementation can be added somewhat incrementally and sort of um, distributed amongst other folks who are interested in contributing. But this is uh, the current plan, and uh, we'll be working on this in the coming months. In the second part of this talk, I plan on looking at uh, XTS versioning. And I know this has been a source of considerable friction in the Envoy community in the past year. So I'm hoping that this plan that I present has uh, sort of reflected some of the feedback that we've received and is providing us path forward to achieving the best uh, properties of versioning while still uh, being thoughtful and mindful of uh, the costs that uh, control plane operators bear when um, implementing some of these schemes. So let's just start with a recap of versioning in Envoy. And you, you know, we may even ask, uh, this takes us back to last year's Envoy con, but like the, one of the first things to ask is like, why are we even doing versioning? And the, the basic reason is that we were previously had a, just a single unversioned API, which people would randomly remove fields from which doesn't work as a, as a stable API. If you're a control plane operator, um, if you're uh, implementing Envoy as an XDS client and you're not Envoy, uh, X, XDS as a, as a, if you're implementing an XDS client and you're not Envoy, like these things are, are problematic features and we really needed to have a pretty serious strategy for not breaking the API. So we introduced major versioning, which would actually allow us to, you know, turn down entire APIs and bring up new ones. And we were, Planning on doing this initially on a yearly cadence with V2 in 2019, which was the extent API, V3 in 2020, which we did roll out and deprecate V2. And then in 2021, we we're planning on introducing V4, removing V2, et cetera, and one per year. And that was uh, problematic. We decided to stop the clock right there because 
Uh, it turned out that there is just too much control plane operator developer pain, which I'll go into. I have a mini retrospective in the next few slides. But that's essentially where the situation we're in today. We're not getting rid of major versions, but we're not going to issue one per year. And we're going to come up with a more incremental approach towards versioning, which I'll explore in the next few slides. So a quick retrospective, the good, the bad, the ugly. Well, good things is major versioning did solve our breaking change problem within major versions. We built sophisticated tooling and Envoy to automate most of the upgrades. So it was a lot uh, smoother than it would have been if we'd done it manually. And there were a bunch of technical improvements in V3 over V2, which were made possible by the ability to break the API over the version bump. What went badly? Well, we had a fair bit of code churn. That's not too bad, though. We didn't finish Basil integration. Um, so there's this generated API shadow thing that you may be familiar with if you're a Envoy developer and you need to run fixed format for. We didn't have um, at all parts of V3 ready to go on day zero. And there's some complexity around handling versioning in Envoy. Now, the really ugly parts are control plane developers and operators had a lot of pain. And they didn't have the same tooling and libraries that we had in Envoy. There was a lot of confusion. They weren't ready on day zero for upgrades and documentation. And some of this, you know, I would say, um, reflected the lack of interest in control plane operators and what we were doing while we were putting together this proposal and socializing the Envoy community. But some of it we probably should, we should have been much uh, better prepared for and ready to go at day zero. There was also a performance overheads of upgrading resources from V2 to V3 inside of Envoy, because Envoy internally operates a V3, and this caught quite a few people. And there's a lot of conflation over what is a transport and a resource version and so on amongst the Envoy community and confusion as a result. Okay, so what's the actual new plan? Well, we're going to slow down major versions. We're not going to not do a major version in the future, but we're not going to do one until the benefit really outweighs the identified costs. And this has been a useful learning experience to capture that. We're going to switch to a scheme called minor and patch versioning to make things more incremental. And so, you know, borrowing from the sort of the semantic versioning terminology, although this isn't semantic versioning, um, Major versions are going to be when we want to break the world, they happen rarely, and we can actually remove fields from the API. Minor versions are going to occur once per year. And what's going to occur at these uh, uh, clock ticks is nothing's going to be removed from the API, but XDS clients can remove support for deprecated features at these clock ticks. And um, finally, we'll have patch versioning, which, which will basically change in every API change. And this will let you know exactly what version of uh, the API a client is at, which is useful for feature discovery. OK, so Matt's got a very detailed plan of record around this. And I recommend checking this out if you're interested. Uh, the, the, the devil's in the details. And um, Adi, who's a Googler, who is going to be working on this um, in Q4, and he's going to be looking at things like, you know, how do we do version negotiation and feature negotiation, which are really important to coordinating XDS clients and control planes in this world. OK, now what are the implications? Well, if you're a control plane operator, you're going to have to state a policy and support one around which minor versions you support. If you're a control plane developer, you need to uh, support a range of minor versions and uh, support negotiation of features and version. XDS client developers need to pretty much do the same. And anyone who wants to is willing to put in the work of being an API shepherd can join in the process of deciding you know, what gets deprecated and when to uh, help guide these, uh, um, these minor version changes. OK, so the new version may, uh, roadmap kind of looks like the first two uh, points of 2019 and 2020 are the same. Next year, uh, in Q1, we're kind of introducing 3.1.0 minor version, and we will remove v2. Um, that is going away. So if you still rely on v2, you should be moving to v3 because that is going from the Envoy code base. Um, and then each year from then on, we're going to start um, uh, introducing minor versions and um, uh, deprecating things which are more than uh, at least a year, uh, which have had deprecations of at least a year. OK, so there's a bunch of resources around this uh, linked to this slide. Um, if you download the slides and click through them, you can follow up on them. Um, at this point, I think we're done with the uh, presentation part of this talk, and we're happy to take questions. Thank you. Hello. Hello. All right. So should we tackle the one about the um, collections?
including collections? Like, I think that's something we could support. I'm not sure. We'd have to look at the use cases and make sure there's no implications, but it seems on on just first thinking about it, it sort of seems like we could do that. Yeah, for list collections, sure. I mean, we already have the XDS client um, going back and forth to the server multiple times when fetching a collection. And so this is right. essentially just adding a bit of hierarchy there. So there's no reason we can't support it. I guess we would just need to understand the use case for that first, because it's, I mean, like looking at the existing proposal, we already have a fair bit of conceptual complexity around collections, around we have these list collections, and then we also need these glob collections for performance and scalability. So ideally we have, uh, we, we land these first and then we, we, add, we add the, yeah. uh, and, and, and then uh, some sort of notion of nested collections, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the nice thing about it is that it wouldn't, you know, it, it, this would sort of just be a change to the data model for list collections because list collections are just a resource, right? right so it doesn't right. really have any transport protocol implications, which is nice. Um, but yeah, I agree. Let's let's do the basic stuff first, and then you know we can we can see where we go from there. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. I think so. We had another question around um, how are we managing trust amongst authorities and things like Spiffy and so on. So right now, I think this actually ties into another uh, sort of related concern, and that is how do you actually like um, sign and attest to the uh, um, integrity of XDS resources? That doesn't really exist today, but it seems that the, at the resource level, um, it would make sense to introduce um, some sort of notion of signing so you can uh, have an idea of who is responsible for producing this uh, resource and is it in the actual original, you know, intended condition. And tied into that would then be some idea of like what is an authority and um, how do we actually identify them using, you know, certs and that kind of thing. So I think like we have an idea that this is where we want to head and there's various points in the API where it makes sense. If you look at the proposal and the the config source is essentially what identifies and maps an abstract idea of an authority down to the concrete transport. It seems that would be a good place to also attach um, certificate information as well. And the XCS resource objects themselves are now in a wrapper uh, object, and that is where essentially the, the signature would go. But this scheme has not been fully designed yet. We re it's really just at the, at the stage at which we understand how you would probably go about building this. And I think like anyone's actually interested in helping to drive that would be very into them because I think that's a really important part of making this work for real in a like um, situation where you have you know mutually untrusting parties and that kind of thing. Yeah, I think I think one of the one of the challenges with with the whole signing thing that we're gonna have to think about when we when we really start looking at signing in detail is you know it that sort of thing I think could work fairly well if what we're signing is the XDS resources themselves, but if you've got some sort of you know control plane infrastructure behind the management server that you know what users actually configure is not that form but a different form and then it gets converted, then there's this whole chain of trust thing you yeah. know through that whole workflow that that makes things a little bit more complicated depending yeah. on how much you're mutating the data. That gets back to like the original point of this idea of like a disaggregated control plane. So today control planes are like just a single monolithic service, which is probably fine while they're simple. But uh, you can think about, you know, breaking up the control plane. And even amongst those who, let's say, were fronting their control plane with Go control plane, they probably have a pretty sophisticated configuration pipeline behind that, which runs in a different service and that kind of thing. Okay, I think we have one minute. Uh, if, uh, are there any other f uh, questions or we can uh, hand a minute back to the next session? Once, twice, twice. Okay. Sounds like we're done. Thank you.